the Lord Jesus, my Father, let your will be done. Na vida de todos os que vão participar dessa In the lives of all who will participate of this meeting. In the name of the Lord Jesus, may there be comprehension. A do entendimento para que todos of understanding so that all all 100% may understand perfectly what is your good and pleasant will for each and every one of us. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. You can have a seat. Very well. You remember when, when Jesus said he was questioned how to do the work of God, how to execute the works of God. And Jesus replied, the work of God is this, that you believe in He whom he sent. So it means that the work of God is to believe in the Father who sent Jesus. But does it mean that the work of God is not to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, to visit the, those in prison, to be a pastor, assistant, wife, to be a bishop, to take care of a church is this not the work of God no 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 Jesus says the work of God is this very clear is there any interpretation here the work of God is this that you believe in he whom he sent John 6, verse 29. John 6, verse 29. If you want, you can confirm it there. The work of God is this. He was replying to those who asked him, what should we do to execute, to do the work of God? The work of God is this, that you believe in him who he sent. But then, here is the question at hand many people say here believe in the Lord you, and you shall be saved you and your household so I believe in Jesus so I'm saved and my household will be saved the believers say I believe in Jesus so my house will be saved it doesn't matter if there is hell breaking loose at home with children who are addicts, parents who are not understanding themselves or getting along. I believe in Jesus, so all will be saved. How can it be? The Catholics say, I believe in Jesus and we believe as well. We believe in Mary, we believe in St. Anthony. We believe in Jesus too, very well. So this is to do the work of God. Any believer who believes in Jesus is doing the work of God? No. No. So what's wrong? Did Jesus say anything wrong here? Because he said he defined the work, the execution of the work of God that you believe in he who sent him, which means he who sent Jesus. But that's not all. So believers believe in Jesus, Catholics, and all who claim to believe in Jesus, they're doing the work of God hypothetically, theoretically speaking, but the demons also believe in Jesus. And then, how is it? Is this not what James said? You believe that there is one God. You do well. The demons also believe and tremble. 
Hold on. So the demons believe in God. So the demons are also doing the work of God. If you believe in God, if to believe in God is to do the work of God, so then the demons are doing the work of God. The men who believe are doing the work of God. All who are believing in God do the work of God. And we know that the world is a pandemic demon. A, 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 apart from the pandemic. So if all who believe in God do the work of God, then theoretically speaking, everyone is in peace because everybody does the work of God. All believe in God. And we know that's not the case. We know that the world is evil. And then comes a question. So Bishop, what is the quality of belief which Jesus is referring to when he says that he who believes in God, he who sent him, is doing the work of God? What kind of belief is this? And I speak like this so that you may think about your faith for you to reflect and look at yourself through the mirror of God see yourself before that which the Lord Jesus says it's for that it's for that that's what I want you to think with me Theoretically, all believe in God, including the demons. So, all do the work of God. But then comes the question. For example, in the case of the demons, in the case of the demons, so the demons believe in God. They believe in God. But why are they demons? How can a demon believe in God? and be like us who believe in God and do the work of God. And then comes this question. If believing in God is similar to the belief of the demons, what good is it to believe in God? If the quality of belief which the demons have in God is like ours, so then what difference does it make? What difference does it make? Because in spite of the demons believing in God, by any means is there any hope to better their lives, to improve their lives? Because they believe in God. Is there a chance for them to be saved? What do you think? Is there a chance for the demons who believe in God, all demons believe in God, for them to be saved? No, there isn't. There isn't. They are and will continue being eternal enemies of God, although believing in God. Yes or no? Do you agree with me? Do you agree or not? They will not cease being demons. They will not cease living eternally in the lake of fire and sulfur. They will not cease being punished. There's no hope for the demons, although believing in God. Would this kind of faith not be the one which most of those who believe in God be the one which people have practiced, including pastors, ex-pastors, and ex-bishops and pastors and assistants, would this not be the kind of faith which they have presented to God? Would it not be 
the same. But the difference is that the demons are already defined to their perdition. But those who are alive, they have hope. If they believe in God, as the scriptures say, as is written in the scriptures, from inside of him will flow rivers of living water. Is it not what the Lord Jesus said? Jesus said, whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow. So see that the quality of belief which Jesus requires and guarantees the eternal life is that belief in God which obliges the one who believes, the believer, to be a river of living water. This is the belief which God wants, which distinguishes the believing believer or the demonically possessed believer and the believer of God. Because the believer of God, rivers of living water will flow. It has to flow. And because these rivers of living water flow, so then he's doing the, the work of God. The work of God is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. When you believe truly, which means you marry God, you unite with Him, you prioritize Him in first place in your life, above all and everything or anything, the first, the very first, Jesus said this in other words, Whoever loves father, mother more than I is not worthy of me. Whoever loves wife or husband or children, brother or sister more than I is not worthy of me. So belief, the belief which God requires from each and every one of us is that belief in which by obligation you are a river of living water. You have to be this river of living water. If you believe in God, but you are not a river of living water, water, this belief of yours is like that of the demons. Because there is no midterm. Either you believe like the demons who, whose destiny is sorted, it's fixed, it's defined, or you have of that which the Lord Jesus speaks. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So it's the belief. This kind of belief is what distinguishes us from the belief which the world offers to Jesus. See in the mirror if you are a fountain, if you are flowing. See in the mirror of the word of God, if your life is flowing living water or if it's dirty, if it's a filthy a, or a dry fountain, each one has to evaluate himself. Still about belief, Jesus said, He says to the Samaritan woman, whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst again because the water I give him will make of him a fountain of water which springs up to eternal life. This is the work of those who believe in God, be it a pastor or assistant, be it a bishop, whatever one might be. It doesn't matter if 
the person occupies a role in the church or not if if he believes in the Lord Jesus so then by default he is a fountain he has to be a fountain he has to be a fountain he has to be a blessing which is what God promised to Abraham God said to Abraham you will be a blessing in other versions he said be a blessing be a blessing you will be a blessing in Genesis chapter 12 verse 2 I will bless those who bless you I will curse he who curses you so if I am a fountain if I am a fountain of living water by default those who bless me they shall be blessed those who curse me they shall be cursed I don't have to curse anyone and I don't even bother doing such and in obedience to the Word of God I curse no one no one because Jesus taught us not to curse I have authority to curse but I'll not do this ever never by no means because Jesus taught us not to curse the authority which the fountain has is so great that if he curses he'll be cursed it's what God said to Abraham Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 you will see this there verse 3 as well I'll bless those who bless you curse those who curse you this is fixed it's as is so I don't have to fight with my enemies I don't have to draw the sword and cut my enemies no I will allow them to reap the fruits of that which they try to do to me why because I am a fountain but now if I am not a fountain if out of me the flow of the Holy Spirit does not occur in my conduct in my behavior be it at home in the streets at work in the church at any place whoever's a fountain is a fountain whoever's a fountain is a fountain in the desert in the city at any place he's a fountain he's springing up he's always springing up because he's a fountain why is he a fountain because he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ truly but when one believes in a fake manner a fake belief in Jesus the person thinks he is of God he thinks he has the Holy Spirit he thinks he is someone important he thinks he is a fountain but the fruits which is the water the living water it should be it must be the living water but the fruits which flow they are spoiled adultery fornication promiscuity theft lies what else rebellion and all sorts of sin this is the reality so every worthless thing springs out of that fountain not of God but of hell of the devil that person is an instrument a vessel of hell and whatever he does is to jeopardize another one his neighbor just as there is a fountain of life for everlasting life of which the Holy Spirit springs up through this fountain of life there is also the fountain of death for eternal death this is the reality there is the belief of the demons which does not change their situation and the belief of those who are truly of God who believe truly in the Father God Father that the Father sent God Son and God the Son 
He purchased with his own blood our soul. So I was purchased. I am a property of God. He purchased me. I was not the one who chose him, but he chose me. He did not choose you. Or rather, you did not choose him, but he chose you. So he who was chosen, he was chosen not to preach the gospel, not to be an assistant or pastor, etc., but in order to be a fountain. This is what God did to Abraham. You'll be a fountain, a blessing. You have the obligation to be a blessing. We have the obligation to be a blessing itself. Do not think that God looks at you as a pastor, as a bishop, myself, nor anyone as a bishop. No, this one's a bishop. This one's special, negative. He sees us as a fountain of His in this world in the manner in which He saw Joseph there in Egypt, a fountain of life. Joseph, he symbolizes, he typifies Jesus. Joseph typified Jesus, the image of Jesus. Everything Jesus went through, Joseph went through. Obviously, in a, in a much smaller scale, but he did. So when one believes in God... One fears God, as was with Joseph. Joseph was a God-fearing man. And what made him different, and what made him separated from all back then, was for him to be God-fearing. His brothers, sons of his father, were not God-fearing. And this is why Joseph was separated by God in order to be a fountain. Wherever Joseph would go, God was with him and he prospered. Which means flowed out of that, flount, that fountain. He flowed, it flowed. Think carefully. Jesus was this fountain. Obviously, we don't even have to say this. But he was a fountain because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he was a servant of God. God, God conceived Jesus, his son in this world, in order to serve him. First, he was conceived as a child of God and then anointed with the Holy Spirit in order to serve God. Just look, the sequence, the chronology. First, God conceived His Son and then anointed Him with the Holy Spirit. And He was what He was, He did what He did. He only served God. In order to serve God, it's not enough to only be a child. One needs to be anointed with the Holy Spirit. Or be it, He needs to be a fountain. Jesus became the fountain and only after, at the age of 33, at 30 rather, he began to, to spring up the living water. So this is how Joseph was. Joseph also began his, we could say, the good phase at the age of 30. Because... From the age of 17 until he turned 30, he was a slave, imprisoned. He suffered all sorts of injustices. So Joseph was a refer, uh, referential of God in his days. Abraham was a referential of God in his days. He was a blessing. Joseph was a blessing. All whom God called chose they were a blessing because they feared God they believed in God above all things above all things Paul was a blessing he was a blessing itself a fountain or was he not 
He was the one who had the majority of the revelations. The other apostles as well were, but all of them, all of them suffered for being a fountain. All of them suffered. All. They did not flee from the tribulations. All were a blessing. Why? Because it is the obligation of those who believe in God differently from the demons. It is their obligation to be a fountain. But not as a pastor or bishop, no. But as a person, as a child of God, as a servant of God, as the example of Jesus himself. Do you get what I'm saying? Is this clear? Or do I have to draw it? Joseph, who typified Jesus, his character, his manner, his conduct, showed that he feared God. He did not corrupt himself with the wife of Potiphar because he feared God. It's not because he was, oh, I'm not going to betray my Lord. No, but he had God's character. He was a fountain of God. He typified God in the world. All who, were, who typified God in the world glorified God. They sprung up living waters and we need to be this kind of God here in the world you need to be this kind of God see if this is not what Jesus said he says the demons also believe the demons also believe but they don't cease being demons nothing will change their lives but Jesus said Whoever drinks of the water I give him will never thirst. So whoever is a fountain does not thirst. Springs up water. Because the water that I shall give him, who is the Holy Spirit, will become in him a fountain. The water who is the Holy Spirit, when one is baptized with the Holy Spirit, sealed with the Holy Spirit, truly... He is a fountain of blessings. He is a fountain of living water, of water which generates other lives. Because he says here, the water that I shall give him, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So a person who believes in God according to the scripture, be him a pastor or not, a missionary or not, he needs to be a fountain. What makes a difference between us? So then you ask, Bishop, what's then the difference between a pastor, the evangelist, a prophet, the teacher, the master, from those who aren't? What's the difference? The difference. The only difference is this one. Those who are evangelists or prophets, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors or masters, it's that they are dedicated, dedicated to serve God, to serving God, a hundred percent. And those who are fountains but are not apostles, neither prophets or pastors nor masters or anything in the church, still they are fountains which are also springing up life, everlasting life wherever they go. Why? Because it's at work, in their testimony, exactly as Joseph was. See, Joseph and Jesus. Jesus would only work for the Father. He only served the Father. 
the pastor, the evangelist, the missionary, the apostle, the apostle only serves God. He does not serve himself. He does not live for himself. He lives the work in order to serve God. They were called in they were called to the tabernacle or the temple or the house of God. The others who are not pastors, they're not missionaries or evangelists or bishops and none of this. They are members. But still, they do not cease being a fountain. They have the obligation of being a fountain as much as those who are only in the temple because they have their duties imagine if God made everyone to be a pastor evangelist apostles so he needs to have those who will work there outside who will testify outside who will spring up at work regardless of their profession, be a lawyer, engineer, teacher, doctor, whatever he might be, whatever he does, he needs to spring up the living water. He needs to be a fountain. So he's not worse nor better than those who are only strictly working in the temple. They are the same. The condition is equal from both parties because both are fountains. This is how Joseph was. Joseph was whose servant? Potiphar's servant. He served an unbeliever, demon-possessed man. Still being the governor, he still was a servant. A pharaoh. Jesus only served the Father. His work was to move from city to city, town to town, healing the sick. But Joseph and Jesus were both fountains. Both were representatives of God. They typified Jesus here on a uh, God here on earth. Because God is spirit. How will he manifest himself in this world? Through those who are in the world, who are fountains. Do you get where I'm trying to get? So when you are a fountain, you spring up regardless of the role you occupy or the place you are. You're a fountain. You're a fountain wherever you are, at every place. It's what is written here. Jesus said, in other words, it's here. It's clear, crystal clear. Crystal clear. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture reads, fountains of living water will flow out of their hearts. The demons believe in God and tremble. But what's the difference between the belief of the demons and ours? The difference is that the demons are already defined. They believe that God is only and they tremble. If you watch the testimony of Alberto, Gilberto, manifesting when Bishop Adilson asks him, would you like a chance? If you had a chance, what would you do? Immediately he knelt down, put his face against the ground and said, Oh, I would give it all to have such a chance. I don't know if we have the footage. Let us, you're going to see. He's going to speak here now. Let's pay close attention. Legião, você é o chefe? 
e as do ventre da mãe dele. Por quê? O que, que uma, um bebê tem a ver com isso? Por que, que você entra na vida de um ser humano já desde o ventre materno? O que, que é mais sagrado para o homem lá em cima? Não é a alma. Pois é, eu venho buscar ela desde o ventre para me levar para o meu reino. Quer dizer que toda vez que uma criança é gerada, já começa a vir uma disputa. Já. Eu trabalho com aquilo que eles não podem ver. O que, que eles não podem ver? A alma. É isso que você quer? É isso que nos fortalece. É a única forma de ferir o homem grande. A única forma de ferir a Deus é tocando nas almas. Na, no bem mais precioso dele, a criação mais preciosa. Mas tem gente que acha que o bem maior dela é a casa que ela tem, é o carro, ah. é a conta no banco. Ah, ah, ah. Isso aí passa, isso fica. A alma, ela prevalece. People who think that their most precious possessions is the house that they have, the car, the bank account. <laughs> These are temporary. <laughs> The soul. It prevails. And you, have you already taken many souls? Many are shouting down there for those people who don't believe. So does it mean that it's down there? Sir, let me make here. Have you ever seen a soul shouting from above? So it's down there. Here they have the agony of the difficulties that we put before them. <laughs> but down there... It is different there. There is fire. When a person leaves the body, leaves their flesh, separates from their body of flesh, society stays interested in the body. Everyone calls the family members asking where the funeral is going to be, where will a body go, where will it be buried. Everyone is after the body, aren't you? Uh, no. This is the dust of this earth. So what do you want? We want souls. How is this division made? How do you know that the soul is yours if the person was killed, knocked down by a car and died? How are you going to know that that soul is yours? That name, if someone dies in him, they will have eternal life, sir. If you died in that name, is that it? We'll have eternal life. That's why you fell down on your knees to him? It's what these people don't know. They don't have any idea of how so the demon believes he believes and what does he do he kneels and even puts his face against the ground it's at the as the scripture of james reads the demons believe and tremble they can do nothing with god but they can hurt God with the destruction of a soul. Soul. The soul is what occupies your body. It is occupying our body, the soul, our soul. The spirit is our intelligence, our intellect. But the Bible says that the Spirit returns to God, which means the wisdom God gives us returns to God. The knowledge of the scientists, those who invented the airplane, 
technology and the modern world, this spirit, this intelligence returns to where it came from. Who is God? Who is knowledge, wisdom himself, the spirit. However, the soul, no. This each one has to decide on his own. Each one has to decide on his own. You have a soul and only you can decide its destiny. When you trip over a stone and you feel pain, you hurt your foot, you injure your foot, you felt the pain on your foot, but that pain, your soul feels it. So much so that when a person dies, you can hurt them, you can burn them, they feel nothing. But when the soul returns, it feels it all. Which means the soul is what feels pain, is the one which feels pain. So all the problems we face, the, the upsets, the joys as well, everything the soul feels when a person has insomnia the soul wants to rest to sleep we could say but it can't the person has a problem so when a person has a problem of depression the soul is desperate he can't take it anymore because it is being suffocated by these entities be it with insomnia, fear, nervousness, etc., etc., etc. So when you feel any sort of pain, although this pain might be in the intestines, the liver, the head, the foot, the arm, wherever it might be, your soul feels that pain. It's not your body. The body you use, your soul carries it, but the soul feels all the pains. People take care of the body, they wash, they bath, they shower, they exercise, they feed. They give everything the body apparently enjoys. But it's not the body which enjoys, it's the soul. So when this substance in form, the soul is not satisfied, it hungers, it thirsts. When Jesus said, whoever thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He's not talking about the physical thirst for H2O, but the water, or, or rather the thirst, or the water which quenches the soul. When you see one suffering, and you give one word to that person, immediately you encourage that person. Is it not true? Because the word reached what? The flesh. No, it reached the soul. The soul is thirsty. When you get to someone who is suffering with the word of faith, you feed the soul of that person and he's encouraged. Likewise, when you are upset or when you face a crisis and someone puts his hand over your shoulders, embraces you and says, God is with you, immediately you feel what? Comforted. Your soul is being comforted. The upset is in the soul. The pain is in the soul. So this being called soul is inside of you, inside of me. We do not see the soul. We only feel. The soul only feels. And here is where your greatness is. God wants to save the soul. He came to save the soul. But in order to save the soul, you need to find someone who has the spirit, which means the mind, the intelligence of God, to bring the right word to that person. And then he redoes his own life. It's my work, it's your work. 
But in order for you to give the living water to a person, you need to be a fountain. You cannot take the water which springs up from me, place it in a bucket and give it to that person. No, you need to give the water. The fountain, the water needs to come out of you. Do you get where I'm trying to get? This is the situation of people who are around. Those who are deceived. The fake believers are the majority. The unbelievers are the majority amongst the believers. All have the chance which the demons did not have. The chance of drinking this water and also become a fountain. I cannot accept. I cannot permit. Look, if I have the Holy Spirit ever since my new birth, if I have the Spirit of God, it's not possible for me to have any sort of personal dream or project. It's not possible because the mind of God, I have the mind of the Lord Jesus, the mindset of God, the Spirit of God, and He guides me, He conducts me, He speaks. He exhorts, He directs, He convinces me of sin. I cannot admit to have the spirit of the Creator and only think about myself. Do you agree with this? Is this possible? Is this admissible? No, it's not possible because when a person believes in Jesus as the Holy Scripture reads, by default he becomes a fountain. And a fountain is different. I was speaking to Bishop Adilson. A fountain is always springing up. Living water. It's not recycled. But the fountain springs up new water. Every day, all the time, non-stop, it's a new water. You can see this in the preaching, in your work of the preaching of the gospel. You'll preach the word of God. Sometimes you read the same scripture, but the water is new. It's new water. Why? Because the fountain will reach someone who is thirsty, who needs exactly that word. So people need to understand in order for them to be a fountain. First they need to believe. But to believe how? As the example of what Jesus said, to believe is for you to surrender body, soul and spirit. I don't know if we have the testimony of Gilbert. His testimony speaks for itself. Just look what this demon-possessed young man speaks. After receiving the Holy Spirit, it's a wonderful example. You can play it. My name is Gilberto. I came to the Universal Church with a frustrated and defeated life. From the age of 11, I grew up in the spiritual world because my brother was a witch doctor serving the altar of the entity so I only had losses I lost I lost first of all my character I lost that being which I was that innocent person I was I lost jobs important jobs because I depended on my jobs in order to take care of myself I used to pay rent back then addictions of to cocaine crack weed I had 
I was addicted to alcohol and all sorts of alcoholic beverages. I was addicted to cigarettes for 12 years. I was already thinking about committing suicide, but I did not have this courage of committing suicide. So I decided to seek someone who could help me, which was a higher force. So putting my knees to the ground, I sought for God and I spoke to him and said I had no strength. I was so insignificant that I had no strength even to commit suicide. I wanted to get rid of drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, but I had no strength to let, get rid of it. And about two days later, I was watching Heko and I heard an, an invitation from the program of the Universal Church and that caused an impact on me. It called my attention because there, there was a man saying that there was a way out and that gave me strength. It encouraged me. I took a decision. I'll go there because if this is true, it needs to happen with me. So that's when I came to the Universal Church. I got there. But there's a detail when for me to get there, there was challenges, wars because I had a bicycle and the tire got flat and where I used to live to the church, it was quite distant because the church was in the city center and the suburb I lived in was far. So I went back home to get a couple of coins to pay for the transportation. And I don't remember what happened, but that money disappeared. Those coins disappeared from my pockets. I lost that money. So I said, I'm going to walk. And that's how I got to the Universal Church on a Friday. And seated there, I looked at the altar and it was written, Jesus Christ is the Lord. I looked and I said, wow, the Lord is here. And just there in front of the altar by the side, there was an empty cross. And I was used to seeing a cross with Christ there, stuck there, nailed there. And I was like, why is this one empty? So that caught my attention. And this is how the service began, half past seven. The pastor came close to me. I remember as if it were today, he said to me, young man, did I see you here today? I said, no, it's my first time being here. He said, can I say a prayer for you? I said, yes, you can. He laid hands on me and he said, in the name of the Lord Jesus, that's all I heard. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I passed out. And that's where I passed out. And that's when I returned at the end of the service, he said to me, if you want, if you want to be free from this evil, he pointed his finger to the name of Jesus. He said, make a covenant with him, partner with him because he can set you free from this. I went back home and that same Friday, I grabbed a cigarette and smoked and returned on Sunday to the house of God, manifested again. That entity was cast out, was sent away. However, I went back home and I returned to smoking. And once again, I came for the deliverance service and I manifested. It was hectic because I would live, I'd be inside of the church, participate of the service. I was a tither, yes, I would return tithes and my tithe and my offering were equal. I was there, faithful, but my faithfulness was restricted to the tithe because practicing the word, I was not practicing. I ceased to pray, to fast. I no longer had strength neither to pray nor fast. Then I started to watch pornography and that's where I fell. And then one day I opened my heart. When I arrived at a service on Friday, I said, my God, today it's all or none because I don't want to leave here with this evil in my life. Either he leaves here or I leave once and for all from your presence. Either he leaves my body, my life, or my life will leave your presence. 
And on this day, this Friday, it was Bishop Adilson. He was conducting the service there in the cathedral of my town, in the town of Beijing. And he called, he said, those of you who got involved with entities, not those of you who just went there just to clean up there, no. But those of you who actually got involved with the works there, come here in front. I remember as if, I remember because there were many people and many people were impeding me from getting to the front. So I went from underneath. I went underneath people's arms and I went right ahead to the front. And I remember Bishop Adilson looked in my eyes and said to me, look deep into my eyes. And he pointed to me and he said to me the following. The chief demon in his mind manifest there now how many of you are there seven thousand are you the boss who is the strongest there i just remember waking up and that weight i carried had left me i was light i was happy smiling my countenance had switched and i left there revolted i said never again will i manifest i put that inside of me never again will you take possession of my body never again will you take possession of my life and i began to pray i began to fast i began to make purposes with god i began to participate more of the services I heard about the campaign of Israel. I was already in the church. I already knew about the campaign of Israel. So I said, look, there's only one way for these entities, these unclean spirits not to return to my body. Because I was already participating of the services, Wednesday seeking the Holy Spirit. And Bishop would always say, you need to receive the Holy Spirit because only those who have the Holy Spirit are free. So I put all my strength in the campaign of Israel. And I took all I had, all I had, physical, the ma material, and I placed my life because I know from my understanding that God does not want money. He wants my life. It's my life he was asking for. However, I did not want in the beginning to give my life. I still wanted to enjoy a bit. But it was decided, life or death, either I surrender to the Lord of Lords or I'll have to serve the devil. I'll have to serve Baal for the rest of my life. And that's not what I want. So I'm going to the campaign of Israel. I sold all I had. All I had, I sold everything, everything. I climbed up the altar, surrendered. After climbing down the altar on that day, I remember I descended from the altar different, stronger, but not yet baptized with the Holy Spirit. I surrendered my life there, but I was not yet baptized with the Holy Spirit. When I got home, I went to pray and I had asked God after descending from the campaign, I began to ask him, what did he want from me? My God, what is it you want from me? Holy Spirit, tell me, what did I not yet surrender for you not to have baptized me? Because I surrendered my entire life. There's nothing I didn't give you. And he said, I want your mind. I want your mind. And for a while, I... Do you see? He gave everything, everything he had and did not receive the Holy Spirit. And many people have done the same. They've given it all, but don't receive the Holy Spirit. Why? Because deep down inside, the person did not give his all. And to give one's all is to believe, as Jesus says. What is the work of God? What do I do to do the work of God? Believe that you believe. To believe is to marry. There is nothing you leave aside. You surrender everything. Your all for his or her all. This is why 
honeymoon. Theoretically speaking, the honeymoon blood flows in the marital act that blood seals, it marks the surrender from one to the other. It marks the marriage, the matrimony, the covenant which you are making with him or with her, which is God's mark. God invented this. God created this. God created man and woman, one for the other, but that marriage would be sealed in this act. One's all for the other's all. So in marriage, you don't reserve anything. You surrender body, soul, and spirit. Thoughts. You don't think about mommy when you were there in the honeymoon. You don't think about daddy when you were there. You don't think about anybody. You think about nothing. You only think about surrendering to the pleasure of being with the person whom you love. Is it not like this? This is the belief which God demands from us. This was the belief that you believe in he who sent him. And many people, unfortunately, disgracefully for the lack of knowledge or sincerity, they surrender, but not all. They surrender, but their mind is in another place. Let's continue the testimony, please. Why does he want my mind? My God, what do you want from me? Holy Spirit, tell me what I have not yet surrendered. What do you want from me? This is belief in God, which Jesus speaks about, that you believe in God. This belief, which we manifest in God, makes us to be transformed in fountain of life. It makes you to become a new creature. This is the belief God wants. Belief is not to raise your hand and accept Jesus. I did this several times. Many times I raised my hand and accept Jesus. But did not surrender my life. I would not surrender my soul, my mind, my heart. Because I wanted to keep my life in sin. Let's continue. Why am I not being baptized? I surrendered all that I have. And he said, I want your mind. I want your mind. And for a while, I was like, I was thinking, why does he want my mind? For what? I couldn't get that. I couldn't understand. I got down, knelt down and said, Lord, you asked my mind. You asked my intellect. So I surrender it to you. I give all my thoughts. I give all I have. All, all. All I want to be. All that I am today. All I want to be. I plan to be there ahead, my father. I want. I surrender it in your hands. Take it all. I surrender. Be the governor of my mind. At that moment, it was glorious. Glorious because... I felt peace, came a peace internally, I can't explain it, it's so, so unexplainable that I began to worship him, to adore him, to seek him, I felt nothing, I felt nothing because at that moment the only assurance which came upon my intellect was not as the entity would speak to me. But it was here in my intellect. He said, it's over. It's over for Satan. I'm with you. I said, my God. I began to praise him, to praise him. You know, I didn't know whether to cry or to laugh. I began to seek him 
more intensely and I did not sleep that evening. I didn't sleep because I wanted to speak about Jesus. I wanted to tell people what happened to me. And the next day I got up, I looked at my wife and I said to her, you know what, I'm going to the church because I'm going to evangelize. Look, do you see? After he believed, which means he surrendered his mind, all, his mind, his heart, all, God made of him a soul winner, a fountain. To save souls, you don't have to be a bishop, the head, no such thing. To save souls, you just need to be a fountain. In order for you to give life to a soul, you need to be a fountain. Today, it's not, she said, it's not even the day of evangelism today. And I said, I want to evangelize. She noticed the difference in me. She said, your countenance has changed. You look different. I said, God is with me. She said, why do you know he's with him? He's with you. I said, because I am with him. This is the assurance I have because now I am with him. That's all I know. So it is glorious. It's magnificent. I received the Holy Spirit. Today, I'm a married man. I have a good relationship, a good marriage, a woman of God. Do you see? Do you see? He surrendered to God. He believed in God. So then the first thing which was solved here on earth is the relationship with the wife or the husband. Look at the holiness of marriage. The holiness of matrimony. When you believe in the Lord Jesus according to the Holy Scriptures, so then he makes of your fountain and you spring up. And then God sends a person to help you to spring up, to do his will. So you can verify when a pastor falls, the first thing he destroys is what? Marriage. The first thing of a fallen man is his marriage. He's a pastor, a bishop, he's whatever, I don't know what he is, but when he falls in faith, the first thing which is undone is his marriage. He wants another one, a different woman. In the case of a pastor and the woman as well, when she's not of God, when she falls, she wants another man. She wants to taste another ice cream, another flavor. First thing. So the covenant, the relationship with God is undone. The next thing is marriage. When there's a covenant with God, the first thing after comes marriage. Marriage. which God sends to him or to her. When this covenant is broken, the marital covenant is broken, it's because the covenant with God is already broken because he represents Jesus. She represents the church of the Lord Jesus. This is what marriage is. It's the representation of our marriage with God. How do you know that your husband is of God? Because he's faithful to you. He not only loves you, he's faithful, loyal to you. Even in his mind, he's loyal to you. And vice versa. Why? Why is there loyalty? Why is there faithfulness? Why is there commitment? Why is there honesty? Why is there integrity? Because when a person believes in God, 
He receives the character of the Son of God, which is of Jesus. The same character Joseph had. The same character Abraham had. Abraham could have had as many wives as he wanted back then. But he was faithful. He only wanted Sarah. So the character of the person changes the character. Once one's character changes, then he springs up. He ceases to be a living soul, to be a life-giving spirit. The living soul is the nature that, that we are born with. The life-giving spirit is the spirit which gives life. So in me springs up the spirit which gives life, not death, life. But as long as one is not a life-giving spirit, a person continues as a living soul, a fallen soul, lost soul. Regardless of the religion, regardless of the profession, regardless of the pastor he is, he does not believe in Jesus as the scripture reads. Because Jesus said, this is the work of God. If you believe in Jesus, you will be his fountain in this world. If you believe in Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, as the scripture reads, then you will have his spirit immediately. Belief involves it's an immediate thing. When he surrendered his life to Jesus, his mind to Jesus, that's it. The Holy Spirit came upon him. And made out of him a fountain. Which means he believed and believes in Jesus. This is the work of God. What is he? I don't know what's his profession. But he is a fountain. And this is what we all have to be. All the members of the universal church of the kingdom of God, they should. They're meant to be a fountain. Imagine if each and every one of us is a fountain. How many people would convert? But due to the lack of fountains, how many people are descending? Souls are descending to hell. Due to the lack of people to typify Jesus. I need to typify Jesus in this world. You need to typify Jesus in this world. Be you a man, a woman, a pastor or not. Whatever you might be, you will be. You need to be. You need to typify the Lord Jesus in this world. You are a living testimony of His. You are a reference of His in this world. You need to be. If not... It's because you don't believe in him. And if you don't believe in him, so then your soul runs the risk. Because Paul gets to the point of saying, if one does not have the spirit of Christ, which, in other words, if one is not a fountain, he does not belong to God. If one is not a blessing, he does not belong to God. This is what I understand. And I surrender to you. So to believe in Jesus is not to raise your hand and accept Jesus as your Savior. No, this is the doctrine of many churches, Christian churches. But in the universal church, this is our doctrine. If you believe in Jesus as the scripture reads, you need to be, by default, a fountain who will spring up eternal life, everlasting life. You will win others over to Jesus. Quality of belief. Not the fake belief as the belief of Satan, the demons. 
as many people do. No, already accepted Jesus. No, he'll. At times, a woman will say, an assistant is impressed with the young man who says, No, I believe in Jesus. And she goes ahead to marry him because, No, he believes in Jesus. He comes to the church. So what? So what? Just because he comes to church. How many pastors, bishops have fallen in faith? Just because the individual believes in Jesus, claims to believe, but is not a fountain, she surrenders and then lives a living hell in her marital life. Because probably she also does not believe because when one believes, when one is a fountain, there is no way, no way to see that he's not a fountain. Yes or no? There is no way for you to doubt a fountain. A fountain springs up and fresh water, always renewed. It's always springing up, always springing up. Be it at night, during the day, be it in the storm. It might be a storm, a hurricane. Does it stop to spring up? No. In a storm, tribulations, does the fountain stop springing up? No, it carries on springing up. It continues springing up because it's a fountain. It represents God here on earth. You need to represent God on earth. I need to represent God on earth. Amen. Think about this. Look at yourself in the mirror, the mirror of the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit will illuminate your thoughts in order for you not to be deceived, eluded by the appearance which you bring. Oh, I go to the church, I do the work of God, I pray for people, I cast out demons, I preach the gospel. Jesus said this, hold up, Lord, I heal the sick, I preach the gospel, I prophesied. And you say you don't know me. I never knew you. That's, is that not what he said? Because he's not a fountain. It was not a fountain. So I say this with fear and tremble. Over your soul and the souls of people. With much sincerity. Fearing and trembling. I imagine how many people are amongst us, sometimes bishops, pastors, your co-workers, and you know something is lacking in that friend. You know. You know there's something that is not fitting well. Because he was not born of God. He's not a fountain. He did not believe in God as he was meant to, as the scriptures. The work of God is this. So at times a person is more bothered with doing the work, preaching, speaking, healing people, helping those who arrive in the church. People are more bothered with doing than actually being. But how to do without being? How? There's no way. How can you spring up clean water if you're not a fountain? How? There is no way. You need to be a fountain. You need to be a fountain. Be it the wife, be it the husband. Regardless of whatever you are. First you need to be a fountain. Jesus, in order to serve the Father, first he had to be conceived by the Holy Spirit. In order for us to serve the Father first, we need to be born of the Father. Is it not so? Is it not so? In order for us to spring up fresh water, first we need to be a fountain. How can we do something we don't know? How can a person, would you submit to a surgery from someone who's not a surgeon? By no means. First, you need to be in order to do the work of God. Lord, what do I do to do the work of God? I give offerings. I 
work, I'll help the poor, I'll visit the prisoners, I'll do what needs to be done. This is not a reason for you to say that you believe in Jesus. When one truly believes in Jesus, the Lord Jesus himself makes of him a fountain naturally and he springs up naturally he doesn't have to forge a fountain he is a fountain in the name of the Lord Jesus my father I tried to pass to them to share with them that which you have placed within me I cannot draw. I don't know how to use the words properly. But I count on you, Holy Spirit. In order to make of this living water you have given us. To spring up upon my co-servants, my colleagues. The fountain which you want each one of us to become. It's of no use, my Father, to do the work of God with the strength of one's arm. No, first I have to be. If I am a fountain, you are not worried because I will naturally spring up. I will spring up living water. I will spring up into everlasting life. I will spring up. I will spring up everlasting life. And so then, so then my father, make of each and every one who participates of this transmission fountains for the glory, worship, and honor of your holy name. Nothing is more precious nothing is more glorious nothing is greater nothing nothing is more glorious than to be a fountain of the Lord in this earth especially in these last days these last these end of times when many people are descending to the grave hopeless of salvation. My Father, multiply us. Send workers. Multiply the fountains, my Father. Multiply the fountains. Where Abraham would go, he would dig up a fountain until you made, made of him a fountain, a fountain of faith. Make out of your servants, my father, who are perhaps deceived, eluded, excited by the work, but are not yet fountains. They're not yet fountains. Make their thoughts to be illuminated in order for them to evaluate themselves. It's as Paul said, examine, let each one examine himself. Examine. My Father, bring this exam to each one in order to evaluate and to see through the mirror of your word if God's image is within us, if we carry the image of our Lord Jesus Christ generating, springing up living water wherever we go. I ask my Father, awaken your church, awaken your servants, awaken those who are sincere, who are serving, or better said, are trying to serve you without being. Oh, my Father, 
transformed them into fountains so that your work may grow for the glory worship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And praise be to God. May God bless. Did you understand? If you did not understand, get this meeting and listen to it again more times and think listen to it alone plug in your earphones and listen to it on your own so that you may have your encounter with God if you have not yet had may God bless you in the name of Jesus